The scripture reading for today is Matthew 13, verses 24 through 30. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Thank you, Sam. Before this pandemic started, on Sunday night, I was delivering a series of lessons that I had tentatively entitled, because I'm tar- terrible at titles, simply Becoming. And the idea behind the series was that if you are a disciple of Christ, it's not a matter of you are or you aren't, but it's always a matter of becoming. We are all trying to follow Jesus, but we're not just walking around behind him. We are interested in becoming like Jesus, and I'm not like Jesus anytime, all the time, in any way. I'm just trying to become that. But there are some things that I need to be doing in order to become that. And, and, and in, on Sunday night, we talked about some of those preferences. If I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus, I must have a preference for holiness over happiness. I must have a preference for giving rather than receiving. I must have a preference for serving rather than being served. And I must have a preference for being fruitful and being fruitful God's way because any other way means barrenness as far as God is concerned. I must have a preference for accepting discipline from the Lord rather than trying to evade discipline. Because it is in discipline that God moves to mold my life to become more like Jesus. But having gotten that far in the series, and no, I'm not preaching the series this morning. I just want you to remember. Having gotten that far in the series, what troubled me about it was that it seemed like I had said, everything is up to you. If you're going to be a disciple of the Lord, then it's just up to you. you got to decide. You've got to do it. And while you have a role to play, yours is not, by any means, a deciding role. You don't get the only vote. Someone else also gets a vote. And we wanted to move into, and we didn't get to move into, the other person who gets a vote. And that is Satan himself. Satan has this great desire that we fail in following Jesus. And he is determined that we will do it. There is this interesting text. Again, we don't have time to deal with this text in detail this morning. I just kind of want to introduce it to you. There's this text in uh, Luke 22 where uh, Jesus says to Peter, Simon, Simon. By the way, whenever Jesus says something, says the same thing twice, That's a red flag. It means, wake up, pay attention. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. I find that to be a frightening prospect. That Satan might sift me like wheat. That he might put me through his mill. That would be a a horrible thing. The only comforting part of all of that is... That Satan had to ask in order to do it. So someone else is really in control. And that is Almighty God. But when I look at the text, I discover something else. Satan doesn't actually ask to sift Peter like wheat. 
That may be what your Bible has, but that's not what the text says. The text says that Satan demanded with the expectation. It's, it's a word that means a demand with the expectation that it justly be fulfilled. Satan had gone into the presence of Almighty God and demanded to sift Peter like wheat. And I got to tell you, I don't know how that works. I don't know how Satan gets to go into the presence of the Lord and demand absolutely anything. But the text indicates that Satan does have that ability. But keep in mind, he has to ask. He can demand all he wants, but God is the one who gives the permission. And that leads me to the third thing. It's not just you have a role to play in your discipleship. But Satan has a role to play in your discipleship. And God Almighty has a role to play in your discipleship to guarantee you success. You with me? Okay. I went down that little rabbit hole this morning because it has to do with our text. When you come to Matthew chapter 13, you come to the third teaching section of the book of Matthew. And it's in this teaching section where Jesus, for the first time in Matthew, uses parables to get his point across. And the first parable that Jesus tells is this parable of the soils or the parable of the, of the sower. Sower goes forth to sow. And, and the whole idea behind that parable is that your productiveness as a part of the kingdom of God, because this parable is about the kingdom, your productiveness in the kingdom of God has a lot to do with the kind of soil that you are. If you are a spiritually inattentive person, you're not going to do well. If you are a spiritually shallow person, you're not going to do well. If you're a worldly person, you're not going to do well. But Jesus doesn't want to leave you with the impression that it's all up to you. That you determine your success or failure and that you have the only vote. And so Jesus moves to the second part, which is the parable that Sam read to you. The parable of the wheat and the tares, or the parable of the wheat and the weeds. And this is such an incredibly important parable that Matthew tells you what it means. Now, Jesus tells his disciples what it means. But as you read through the Gospels, Jesus will tell a parable. And Jesus doesn't always explain the parable. The, the Bible tells us that Jesus would take his disciples off and he would tell them, now this is what the parable means. But the Bible writers don't always tell us what the parable means. We're going to see two other parables here in just a bit where God doesn't, or Jesus doesn't explain those at all. He just says them. And you're supposed to pick up on what it is that he means. But because this parable has an explanation... It makes it important. And so Jesus explains it. He left the crowds. Verse 36, chapter 13. Went into the house and his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. And he answered by saying, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. Who's that? That's Jesus. Absolutely. The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. Who are they? It's us. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. And just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and he will throw them into the fiery furnace. And in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus wants you to understand that it's not all up to you. That somebody else is operative in the world. Jesus is the farmer in the story, and he plants his people in the world. But he's not the only one farming. Satan is also farming, and Satan is planting his people in the world. And the strange thing is that Satan's people look a lot like God's people, at least at first, you know? They, they start to come up, and, and you can't quite tell the difference between Satan's people and God's people. 
But sooner or later, their true colors show. And now the question is, what are we going to do about the weeds? And the servants say, you want us to go pull the weeds? And strangely, Jesus says, no, leave them alone. Now it's right about here that we need to look at two ways of viewing this parable that both of them are wrong. The first way is, yeah, I had to tell you they were wrong. The first way is that within the church, there do arise those people who are false teachers, those people who are hypocrites, those people who do not live up to Christ, those people who lead other people astray. And this parable would seem to say, you don't do anything about those people, you leave them alone. But the fact of the matter is, this parable is not about the church. Where are God's people sown? Not in the church. Where is it? It's in the world. It's in the world. So this parable is not about the church. It's not about church discipline. It's not forbidding church discipline. Second improper interpretation. And that is, you know, here in the world, you got Christian people, you got unchristian people, and some of these unchristian people, they treat Christian people awfully bad. And uh, th there are things that happen in the world because of Satan's people, and, and, and Jesus says, don't do anything about that. Just leave it alone. But Jesus isn't saying that either. This passage has to do with how you think about the weeds, all right? It's not your job to pull the weeds. The passage is about how you think about the weeds. Satan is operating, and there are some things that Satan does. There are some people that Satan uses in the world that you cannot do anything about. You think you can, and you might even try, but in the long haul, you will see it didn't work. Satan's stronger than we are. And I wasted a lot of time. Doesn't mean that everything is like that, but it does mean that sometimes that's what takes place. There are some things in this world that only God can fix. And have you ever wondered why God doesn't do it? Why does God allow all of this evil and all of this persecution and all of this discrimination and all of this dishonesty? Why, why does God allow that? To, why doesn't God just come and do away with it all? God's God. God knows how to cut weeds, right? He can surely pull it off. But have you ever wondered, maybe, maybe God intends for the weeds to grow along with the wheat? And there's something about growing side by side the weeds that helps to mature this wheat. Our, the best lesson to learn from this parable is this. Our enemy is not the weeds, right? Our enemy is the one who sowed the weeds, and that's Satan, and only God can do something about him. Besides all of that, our judgment is not infallible. What we may view as a weed may indeed not be a weed. It may be wheat that has not yet fully formed. We just think that it's weeds. We don't have the ability to see into people's hearts, to know always what is going on in those hearts. So what is my job in this parable? My job in this parable is to be what Jesus planted me to be, which is what? Wheat. God called me to be wheat. My mama would have said, mind your own business, okay? But my business is the business of being wheat in this world. But there's something else here. How will I look at the weeds? I will look at them and treat them as what? as wheat. Yes. I will look at them and I will treat them as wheat. Now, let me take that interpretation and set it into a, a smaller part of Matthew so that you can see how it works. When Matthew opens up, John the Baptist introduces Jesus to Judea. And John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water, but there comes one after me, 
whose shoes I'm not worthy to carry. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And let me tell you something. His winnowing fork is going to be in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, and he'll gather the wheat into the barn, and the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. What does John expect here? He expects a Messiah who is going to be a revolutionary, who's going to turn things upside down, and he's going to get rid of all of the wicked people. That's what John expects. But what does John get? Matthew 5. A Jesus who goes around saying stuff like, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. And you just got to see John scratching his head and shaking it and saying, What in the world? Not blessed are those who are persecuted, but get rid of the persecutors. And it's such a big deal to John and his disciples that the disciples come to Jesus with their criticism. Don't you care what's going on here? John's disciples fast, but your disciples don't fast. Jesus says, there'll be time enough for that. And the next thing you know, in Matthew chapter 11, John sends his disciples on a hundred-mile walk to Jesus with this question. Are you the one who's supposed to come? Or are we supposed to be looking for somebody else? What's John's feeling? John's feeling is that Jesus isn't the weed puller John always expected him to be. And so when you get to Matthew chapter 13... What does Jesus say? My job's not pulling weeds. Not yet. My job's not pulling weeds. My job is to plant wheat. All right? Jesus knew what he was supposed to be about. Now, when you get to this point, we tend to say, if if that's the way we operate, that we're just supposed to be the people of God, acting like the people of God in the world, if that's what God wants of us, well, we're doomed. Because, <laughs> my goodness, them weeds, they're going to overtake us. And we'll, we'll, we'll never be able to deal with all of the problems that, they've, that they present to us. And pretty soon, the wheat will be overcome and it will be gone. And Jesus says, mm, no, it's not all up to you. Nor is it all left in the hands of Satan. God gets the deciding vote. So after Jesus tells that parable of the wheat and the weeds, verse 31 says, he put another parable before them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, when it, has grown it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. How does all that work? You got this little mustard seed the size of, well, wait, the size of a little tiny deer tick or something like that, you know? And you put it in the ground and, and, and in time it becomes this huge garden plant so that the birds can nest in. How does that work? Well, it works because that's the nature of the mustard seed. And who gave the mustard seed its nature? God. And who gives God's people their nature? God. So it's something within God that empowers His people so that they are not overcome by the weeds, but in point of fact, outgrow the weeds. They don't worry about the weeds. And then, as if to emphasize it again, Jesus tells another parable in verse 33. The kingdom of heaven is like a woman who took and hid in three measures of flour some leaven, some yeast. And she did it until it was all leavened. And you notice, Jesus just drops it right there, you know? So if you've ever made made bread, you know how that works. My wife loves to make bread. I love to eat bread. You could probably tell that. And Monica will mix up this batch of dough, and it'll just look like a flat old lump of clay. And she'll drop it in a bread pan that's about that deep, and we'll wait. 
And in time, that bread grows. It doesn't take very long, but that bread grows till it gets to the top of that pan. Then she puts it in the oven, and it rises above the pan. How does all that work? If I was a scientist, I might be able to tell you how all that worked, but I'm not. But the reason it works is because God is the one who empowers the yeast. That's the way that God made it. And so it is with God's people. The weeds are not our enemy. We should treat the weeds like wheat. Our task is not to identify the people of Satan and root them out. Our task is to be the people of God. So, when John sends those disciples to Jesus and says, Are you the one who's supposed to come or should we look for somebody else? Jesus replies, Go tell John what you see and hear. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised up. And the poor have the good news preached to them. The wheat does what wheat is supposed to do. Jesus does what the Messiah is supposed to do. And when we get about the business of simply being wheat, the end result is this, and this is the text I did not read to you. It is verse 43 of chapter 13. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. If we remember who we are, if, remember, if we remember what it is that we are supposed to be about, God in turn blesses us. We need not fear the weeds. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we are most grateful this morning that you are our Father. And that we have come into your family not by accident, but by your choice and adoption. Not that we adopted you, but that you have adopted us. And you adopted us as we were. You adopt us as we are. We are thankful for the sacrifice of Jesus that has made this adoption possible and made the becoming possible. And we are thankful for his resurrection from the dead that provides us hope despite Satan's attempt to steal it from us. And Father, most of all, we are thankful that you are sovereign, that you get the final vote, that you get the only vote that counts. We don't pretend to know all the wiles of the wicked one, but we are confident that you rule in every realm and that you will deliver us from his grasp. We pray that you will grant us this week courage, to face the newness, the newness that confronts us every day. We pray that you will grant us comfort in the daily reminder of that which is familiar that we have lost. And we pray that you will give us strength spiritually and physically, for we are always dependent on you. Keep your people safe and healthy and keep us focused on always being and showing that we are your people. In Christ's name, amen.